Um, good morning. Welcome to our talk, Bringing Service Security to a New Level, an introduction to SAS bombs. My name is Rose Judge. I'm a senior open source engineer at VMware. I work on all things S bombs re related to tooling, consumption, generation, and standards. This is my colleague, Ivana Atanasova. She's also an open source engineer at VMware, and she works on all things related to software as a service, bill of materials with respect to standards and security implications. So as you've probably gleaned, we're going to cover SAS bombs today, um, but we're going to start at the beginning and we're going to establish what a service is. Um, we're going to make sure that we all agree on that understanding so that we can briefly touch on S bombs before we explore what they might look like when applied to services instead of more traditionally packaged software. Then we'll start to cover complexities around SAS bombs, why they're so hard to generate, but also why they're useful, how we can use them to secure the software supply chain. And then we'll finish by briefly touching on some of the standardization efforts going on around SAS bombs and what the future might look like there. And I have a question to the audience. What is the service? No guesses? <laughs> okay. Uh, it's an overloaded term, and this is why uh, opinions may vary. If, if you were <laughs> brave to answer, <laughs> you might give uh, 10 different perspectives of that. Uh, so it, it depends on whom you ask. So uh, this is why for some people it may be anything that's under a subscription model, like uh, the Adobe bundle, like Photoshop, Illustrator. Do you have any designers? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, it can be Zoom, iCloud, or it can be anything that is cloud-based or a storage provider, or it can be one of those tens of day-to-day -day applications that we use as a service, like Uber, Lime, which is not forbidden in many places, mm -hmm. and any book a doctor applications, or it can be any cybersecurity protection software that's running on all of our devices. And to elaborate more, we are going to give some basic examples in more details. We know that many websites and web applications use 30 third-party providers to integrate certain functions like authentication, payment, federated access control. And in the example here, uh, hosting service may use the content delivery network, which uh, might in, uh, in turn use an identity provider integration that can be provided as a service, as an option for a consumer of the hosting <coughs> service. Or another example are the cloud services. They offer a variety of services depending on how much you would like to offload to them. Or every, and every service offering sustains of a lot of other small services that are backed up by a lot of uh, microservices and etc. Uh, or there are the clients using third-party services, which can be client applications that use one or more third-party service providers to give value to the customer. Or it can be a thin client that is an application that has just enough functionality to access the service APIs. And we gave so many examples that it's now good to say what's well, not a service. <laughs> Obviously, it's not a traditional on-premises system, uh, a software that's installed in organizational machines, hosted somewhere internally. Yeah, it's, it cannot be considered a service. And also, even in the cloud, if it's a private cloud, if it's customer-owned, uh, we cannot consider it a service. And to conclude, for the purpose of this talk, we will consider a service an uh, software whose deployment, management, maintenance, support, and the entire software development lifecycle is controlled by a supplier who is internal to the consuming organization. This is what we will call a service for the purpose of this talk. Okay, so if you're at this talk, you probably have some notion of what an SBOM is, right? In its most rudimentary form, we call it the list of ingredients for a piece of software. So a formal record of components for the um, what's in that software, how it was made, 
Um, if your software artifact is a cookie, it's gonna tell you there's a stick of butter in that cookie, but hopefully it's also gonna tell you where that butter came from, maybe the store it was purchased at, when it was purchased, um, information related to how the cookie was actually made, what did you bake it at, etc. But if we think about this in software terms, this list of ingredients is gonna contain a handful of things. So most importantly, information about the software itself. So the software that the SBOM is describing, hopefully it has things like the name, the version, the supplier, maybe the license, the checksum, um, information about that software. Uh, a software that's any good is also going to contain a list of dependencies. So that same set of information, but per dependency. So license, checksum, name, etc. cetera. Um, and then it's going to also contain relationships about those dependencies to other software in the SBOM. So maybe that's to other dependencies or to the top level piece of software itself. But that's going to help us make that dependency graph so we kind of understand um, what the software is built on. And then it will also contain um, hopefully some applicable references. So this might be URIs, this may outline known unknowns, this may be references to security information, um, but there will be hopefully some sort of applicable references to give us a whole context picture of what this software is made up of. Um, all of this information can be formatted using the two SBOM format, so that's Cyclone DX and SPDX. The formatting of all of that metadata, of course, is the easiest part. The hardest part is getting the information, making sure that it's correct, but the formatting is an important step because it ensures that all of that metadata is machine readable and interoperable with other tools. And then, of course, this concept of SBOM, it's very popular right now, right, with respect to software supply chain, but also um, as companies are preparing to meet Executive Order 14028, which is from the U.S. government that says that any vendor selling software to the U.S. government must contain an SBOM for that software. Okay, so we know what an SBOM is, but why do we need it? And to answer this question, we could design an entire session for this. We could take a long time to answer it, but briefly, an SBOM is fundamental to software transparency. And software transparency is important because we know that transparency builds trust, especially now in a time where supply chain attacks are top of mind. Um, it's imperative that software producers and consumers can trust the software on which they depend. So SBOMs can help build this trust. They can highlight precautions that software producers are taking to produce um, secure quality software, and then they can also help, um, cons or, yeah, help consumers because they can um, be used to validate and verify the software that they receive. So trust kind of gets built on both sides of that relationship. Um, SBOMs can also be used for basic software inventory, so for security and compliance purposes. Um, from a security perspective, Having that record of components can help you do things like check for vulnerabilities in your dependencies. Um, maybe when you do that check, you avoid using vulnerable components or maybe you just better manage the risk around those vulnerable components. On the license side, um, they can be used to check for compatible licenses in your dependencies, so making sure that you're not including restrictive licenses that may affect usage or distribution. And then from a supply chain um, security perspective, SBOMs can help us contextualize risk. So both around the quality of the components that you're using and their provenance. So um, ultimately, this existence of SBOMs, it doesn't do anything on its own, right? Checking that box really does nothing for you. Um, maybe it tells you, like, I have vulnerabilities in my dependencies, but having the document doesn't actually remediate those vulnerabilities, right? Actionable policies must be put into place for an SBOM to create actual utility. So maybe that looks like not allowing a container into production with exploitable CVEs um, or with certain licenses, or maybe you have a policy on a dependencies supplier or a cryptographic signature, right? The way you implement that policy will be unique and specific to your organization, your use cases, but um, an SBOM, while it's not the only mechanism you're gonna use for security, can help put some of those policies into place. 
So can we use SBOMs for services? In their current existence, an SBOM defines the software componentry for a fixed software product. So when the control of a software product is transferred from vendor to consumer, um, you know, the consumer is going to take the SBOM, they're going to ingest it, they're going to make some kind of risk calculation based on what's in that SBOM, and then when there's a new version of the software, they're going to take that new version of the software, that new SBOM, do that same risk calculation, and make the decision, do they update or not. And in this current model, that decision um, to ingest that updated software is the responsibility of the customer, right? Presumably based on their contextualization of risk, based on what's in the SBOM. But in contrast, with SaaS systems, we have a model where SaaS software or the system that the SaaS software runs on, it's frequently changing, right? And the change is outside the control of and oftentimes not even visible to the customer. Excuse me. So SaaS systems are continuously deployed, potentially updated multiple times a day, multiple times a week, a month, whatever it is. Um, but the consumer would need to continually pull for that SBOM to decide if they want to run that version, which they actually have no control over. So they don't really have a choice. There's kind of this assumed trust from the consumer to the provider. Um, additionally, the boundary for what makes up a SaaS system is not as intrinsically defined as a neatly packaged software product, right, where the boundary is a little more clear. Um, so to answer the question, using an SBOM to describe a service, it's a good start, but it's missing context, right? Missing information about the deployment of the software, the service dependencies, maybe the device information, um, where a service is hosted or other off-premise concerns. So the conceptual basis of an SBOM, which is that it's a concrete set of metadata describing a piece of software, it's a building block towards describing SaaS, but we need a better framework than what's currently available to accurately do this. So if SBOMs don't cover everything we need to describe services, what can we use instead? And you're all very smart, I'm sure you can guess. The answer is SaaS bombs. Um, but what are SaaS bombs exactly? Yeah, what is a SaaS bomb? I'm sure that most people came here for this question. <laughs> and the truth is that opinions vary it. Uh, there are <laughs> various ideas about it. Uh, and I will stick to Rose analogy with uh, the ingredients list. So I may say that <laughs> SaaS bomb is something describing this. You have the food content inside and you have the ingredients list for everything inside the vending machine. The s are <laughs> there. But is it enough to know that <laughs> this vending machine is secure? Probably you want to know that when you pay with a card, uh, your data will not be stolen and you won't be robbed and you want to know which provider stands behind that payment we will be able to pay with cash or with card if you pay with cash we will receive your return and if you select for example number 42 we will receive it or 36 we will be hit by electricity and etc so uh, SAS bombs should describe the whole system as it is and of course it's a snapshot of the s bombs inside the SaaS system because you know you need to know the ingredients list for everything that's inside but that's not enough you also need the service specific data mm -hmm. uh, this is a service identifier that should be unique it can be a service endpoint your rail pearl and etc you need a unique identifier of the provider which can be google alphabet google apis com and etc and you need to know the service functions they can be identity authentication certificate authority load balancing and etc you also want to know the geographical locations as not being the host you might be interested uh, of where the service is actually running uh, and uh, you may to need, need to know any communication protocols that are used by the service instances like for example does it rely on HTTP or HTTPS or does it use MQTT and etc. Uh, you also want to know the service status uh, which is showing uptime information you want to know how reliable it is 
and it's about the service but there is something more because here you buy something externally but uh, usually with services it's your data there <laughs> so you're interested what's going on with the data you want to know the data for and exactly where your data is going through which uh, services uh, have access to it uh, is this access violated and etc and you would also like to know the data classification whether it's confidential public private uh, etc so let's give a uh, some concluded comparison to SBOM and SASBOM. Okay, so it's important to remember that SAS is not customer managed, right? It's managed by the provider. So therefore, an SBOM is customer managed, <laughs> uh, meaning that you know the customer receives the SBOM, makes decisions about how to use the software based on what's in there. Um, and that SBOM describes a single delivered artifact with a very clear boundary of where the software begins and ends. You can think of an SBOM as describing really the what of a piece of software. Yeah, while on the other side, uh, services are usually frequently changing. Uh, they are dynamic. Uh, you have frequent deployments and as we uh, defined in the beginning what we will consider service, they are fully provider managed. Uh, so uh, SAS bomb snapshots, snapshots all that dynamics. Uh, so it's a bit complicated to provide all that frequent information and it's more focused on how and what. Like in our Vanic machine examples, the S bombs are uh, what's inside while the SAS bomb says how, it, how you receive it and where it's located. So ultimately, a SAS bomb and SBOM, they're similar, right? They're similar in the sense that they're both describing software and they're communicating metadata around what's in it in a structured way. But SAS bombs are describing the complexity of the how and the where, what, you know, like things, a combination of infrastructure, software components, service endpoints, and the data flow between services. SBOM is more describing what's in that piece of software, which makes up the SAS. And we talked about what is a SAS bomb. Now let's talk about who uses SAS bomb. Yeah, <laughs> to be honest, so let's say that it's not very at scale yet because there are some usages. It's only available in some form in CycloneDX, as one to many relationship between deployment information and the corresponding S bombs. But think of where we are with S bombs. With SAS bombs, we are your further behind. <laughs> so taking into account that the concept of SAS bomb and service transparency is in the process of building at the moment and the tooling is a work in progress so we hope that it's going to be in the nearest future. Uh, we'll rather focus on the conceptual point of view who is interested uh, the interested consumer of that transparency information. And we can define four interested parties at this. We have the service provider, which might need that information for private compliance needs and for security response. We have the end consumer, who would need to prove that their data is well secured and that the service is reliable. And we have the intermediate service provider, which uh, can need that data both from the side of service provider and of a consumer. <laughs> and then we also have the compliance auditors. We all love them. <laughs> they, uh, they can access to internal service provider information or they can be considered fully external depending on the contract and what their role is. And we said what is a SAS bomb. We said who's interested in using SAS bomb. Now let's say why it's hard to create SAS bombs. Uh, the, all the complexities are a consequence of the specifics of SAS. And first we have uh, to have an infrastructure that's capable of collecting the necessary information. And in some use cases, it might be really hard to gather all of that. Uh, we also uh, need to keep an up-to-date snapshot of a runtime system, which is also a complex problem. It's more to an observability problem. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, the willing list to share. <laughs> Does a provider want to expose all that information? 
uh, and to risk uh, their privacy. And of course, we have those privacy and intellectual property considerations that fall from SAS bombs. Um, because so with it you reveal part of your architecture and your ideas behind your service uh, which might be under intellectual property uh, so this is why in SAS bombs uh, especially in the SPX service profile we separated that to internal and shared information so that uh, you can have information that's uh, more complete that's for internal usages and you may uh, classify it on whether you'd like to share with external organizations or not and you could consider compliance auditor uh, capable of receiving such information or not but you have those uh, two levels of protections it can be classified under that uh, we have the interested parties and we have the we can share information depending on what the interested party is it's not necessary to share to everyone and we need to be business protective at this because um, it's all about the business in the end it's about the people using that business and we don't want to ruin that with uh, breaking our all day business uh, privacy we want to be business protective and let's come to the key point. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, we can say the S in SAS bomb stands for security. Um, as Ivana touched on, creating a SAS bomb is no simple task, right? Many hurdles lie in the way to doing that. So what is the point? Why is there so much community effort around this? And why do we care? And most importantly, how can we use SAS bombs for security applications? Um, and the answer is not much different from how we use SBOMs for security applications for non-SAS software. So assuming you have an accurate and complete SAS bomb, which we've already acknowledged doesn't really exist today, it's very challenging to do, um, you can use the SAS bomb for things like software transparency, which we know builds trust between providers and consumers. Um, you can use it to build policy the same way you would for an SBOM. So if the same way you'd say, you know, we don't run software that contains X dependency for SaaS, maybe that policy is something like we don't accept services hosted in a certain country or services without a certain availability guarantee. SaaS bombs can also be used for um, security to determine a vulnerability's applicability. Like does this service contain a dependency that has this exploitable CVE? Has the CVE been remediated in the software? Kind of the same way you would for an SBOM, but the concept is the same where if you don't know what's in your software, you can't even start to make those risk calculations um, until you actually inventory it. And then SAS bombs can also be used for things like security audits, compliance audits. Um, large SAS companies have a financial interest in making sure that the data on their <laughs> SAS platforms remains safe, secure, and private um, in order to protect their customers, protect their own business. And one way to make this guarantee is to regularly perform internal security audits. SAS bombs are going to contain metadata that can help them do that. Customers also have an interest in their privacy and their data and the security around their data. So using SAS bombs to perform external security audits is also um, something that they can do along with compliance um, for security and other legal matters. Okay, so SBOM sophistication, a rise in microservices and SAS products, it's all brought about a need to better document the metadata which represents this SaaS software. And we've really seen open source communities rise to this challenge, especially around standardizing, formatting, um, and kind of defining the terminology we use to talk about SaaS. So there's kind of three main efforts here worth highlighting. Um, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which most refer to as CISA, that's a US government agency, um, it's been hosting bi-weekly meetings with anyone who's interested in this to define what transparency looks like around SAS and SBOMs. Um, SPDX is working on a profile for SAS services in their 3.1 specification for how to communicate this metadata. And then Cyclone DX has a SAS BOM standard that complements their BOM standard. 
Let's say a few words about the CISA working group. Uh, it uh, mainly focuses on integrating the current understanding of S-BOMS in the context of online applications um, and cloud services. And as part of that, it's exploring the needs of and use cases in about S-BOMS in modern applications. It's also exploring the potential value of extending the software transparency model to cloud and service transparency and service infrastructure. And it's a defining a model of transparencies for services uh, to track the transitive graph of online applications and the use of third-party services as well. And it's preparing an advisory <laughs> with all that. Okay, so SPDX, um, they're one of the two SBOM format standards. Um, they're developing a SAS profile in alignment with the work coming out of CISA. Um, this profile aims to support and track popular SAS use cases, and in alignment with CISA, it'll meet any government regulations that come from um, the U.S. government or other governments with regard to SAS bombs. So the profile kind of spans three primary service categories, customer data governance. So this is going to include metadata like data classification, geographic location of the service, data retention, things like that. Um, the second is supplier infrastructure governance. Um, this is going to contain dependency relationships, you know, fourth party service providers, protocols that the services use, um, service availability, vulnerability discovery and management. And then regulatory compliance, um, which will be like, uh, you know, restrictions around geographic and cryptographic export controls. So this is actively under development. It meets every other Monday um, in the morning Pacific Standard Time, but all the meeting minutes are posted. So if you're interested in getting started, you can always subscribe to those. You'll probably see Ivana and myself there. And then Cyclone DX, the other SBOM standard, um, has a SAS profile which um, complements their BOM standard. So, and the way you know the way they approach SAS bombs is to kind of separate SAS and S bombs. Um, given that SAS is more dynamic, it's more likely to change. S bombs are more um, set in stone and typically will remain more static. So. Uh, their approach is, you know, the one-to-many relationship that Ivana talked about. So one SAS bomb to many S bombs, describing the components which make up that SAS, and then the SAS bomb having extra contextual information about the service itself. Um, if you choose not to do it this way, they also support embedding all the service information in their bomb standard. Um, should you need that use case. And what's next? We have the CISA working group. As we said, it's preparing an advisory about software transparency in SaaS environments. We hope that it will be ready soon so that uh, there will be official definition of, of what we talked about. Uh, there is the service SaaS profile in SPDX, which uh, is coming with 3.0. So hopefully in the also yeah, <laughs> free dot one sorry mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course it uh, it's nothing without the tooling that uh, uses this and that consumes this afterwards so that can produce so. Uh, it's a big gap actually at the moment because uh, we have SBOM uh, producing tools, we have observability tools, but we don't have any integration between both. And uh, given that SAS BOMs uh, capture um, runtime system, I think that the future is some um, integration with the observability solutions and then it can all be integrated with security solutions. It's a whole gap and we need that. We hope that efforts will start in that area because it's the next important thing in cybersecurity and services. Yeah. So lots of progress has been made up until this point, but like anything in open source, there's always lots more work to do. So, um, you know, the solutions that we develop around SAS benefit from a collection of perspectives. So if SAS bombs apply to the work you do or your company does, um, we really encourage you to get involved, to reach out, tell us, you know, what are your biggest issues? What are your biggest concerns? What are your needs regarding SAS bombs and service transparency? 
Yeah, you can subscribe to the CISA uh, working group. If you want to receive more information, you can access the SPDX service feeds or you can reach out for any information. Yeah. We would be really happy to follow up. Yeah. And if you have questions now, we'll attempt to answer this. <laughs> Here. Do we need a mic? I'm loud. Okay. I'll just speak here. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, ladies. Excellent presentation. I'm so glad somebody is finally focusing on this area. Uh, I have two questions. One hard and one hopefully the softball. Okay, start with the hard one. <laughs> All right. So, uh, a rise in attacks in hyperscale environments like the cloud is container and VM escapes. So, are you doing any work around creating a SAS bomb for the whole system so that a hyperscaler or a forensic investigator could go through and understand that there was a dependency on an untrusted tenant running on the same resource as a trusted tenant that uh, they understand that that's how they were able to infiltrate the uh, thing fully in the same resource? Actually, it's, uh, there is a uh, part of that data plan to be included in the SPDX profile, including all the uh, logs that usually serve for use, those use cases, especially for security response. So uh, it's one of the things that are planned to be included. Uh, we'll see when the first version of the profile comes out. We don't, we're not sure that everything will be within the first version because there are complexities in creating the metadata, uh, but uh, it's planned for sure. And if not with 3.1, it will surely be with uh, in the SPDX profile. And uh, in the CISA working group, actually, uh, the group didn't reach to cybersecurity yet. So uh, I hope that those sections of the advisory will come sooner. Uh, so we don't have any recommendations there, but uh, with the service profile, it's planned to be there. Yeah. Uh, question 1A. Uh, is there a, a CISA group for service? Uh, actually, there is a one group, that one weekly group every Friday morning. I'm not sure what Pacific time is. For oh, me, it's uh, yeah. 7 p.m. <laughs> I think if you email uh, that uh, S bomb yeah, and just say I want to be included on cloud. Yeah, yeah, and it's about uh, service transparency and SaaS, and everything that's related is in this group, while the bi weekly group is more general. Um, I imagine it through the uh, S-bombs that are snapshotted, but uh, regarding the service itself, there is no database, <laughs> service vulnerability database existing. So uh, at the moment, it's very far from having something like the VEX for services. I really hope that some effort in that direction will be formed. But for the moment, it's all, all um, results to the s bombs and the related external references to vex there i would envision the link happening like from vex back to the s bomb or the sas bomb like instead of having to update these s bombs each time you have a new vex document to reference like having and i think i've opened an issue for this in open vex but having that reference for back to the s bomb where there's some sort of uri that you can associate and i think the system for how you'd actually do that would probably be implemented like within an organization or a company. I don't know if they would be like an open source solution, but yeah, some sort of like correlation that keeps track of, um, I don't know, I think ideally with VEX, like having some sort of feed would be helpful. Like if you did have a pointer from an S bomb, like just having a feed, like an RSS feed that could just regularly update with like the updated VEX information, but I don't think we're there as a industry yet. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, Jack, Do you right? need Mac? Yeah. Uh, uh, very well done. Uh, congratulations and thanks for sharing this. Uh, any other thoughts about how the rapidly evolving LLM space will impact your point of view on these challenges? 
So at least with SPDX, they, the profile, um, the profiles, there's an AI and data set profile. So I would see that working, you know, with the SAS profile um, to kind of separate out that information, but then having references to the elements within those documents between their kind of um, contained namespace of types of information. But beyond that, I haven't, I haven't considered it <laughs> heavily. So use your focus uh, to help collectively the community because I, I can see that <clears throat> we're sort of approaching a bit of a tsunami with respect to the increasing sharing of these technologies and yes. having effective ways of dealing them with them through SPDX would certainly benefit um, the community and help try and get out in front of this uh, fascinating new area of focus. Uh, and I do appreciate somewhat of a disaggregated fashion as opposed to some are looking at this trying to wrap their head around a way of treating LLMs as a different animal as yeah. opposed to familiar piece parts. Yes, yeah, so SPDX is working on like full system traceability all the way down to the hardware. They're starting a hardware profile to model that. So um, yeah, kind of separating them out into categories that all can represent a holistic system.